Okay, welcome to the sixth episode of the Collaboration Podcast. My name is Jonathan Kay, and I'm here with my co-host, Marco Massi. And we are both members of the Sri Aurobindo Association of America, an organization that produces a collaboration journal. Uh, collaboration, now in its 49th year of publication, is a journal dedicated to the evolutionary vision of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Collaboration examines the theory and practice of integral yoga, the place of humankind in the universe, and themes such as consciousness, emergence, and transformation. Articles, essays, poetry, and images explore the human impulse towards perfection and speculate on future possibilities as we move forward in a rapidly changing world. And we have a wonderful guest with us, and we're going to be discussing two um, two articles in the more recent collaboration journals, and I'll turn it over to Marco to introduce our guest. Yeah, our guest today is Baman Shirazi. He received his PhD in East-West Psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies, CIIS. He was in an adjunct faculty and also worked in various administrative positions at CIIS for 25 years, including several years as director of graduate studies and as CIS archivist and a historian. Bahman has also taught at several other Bay Area schools, such as John F. Kennedy University, ITP Sofia University, and Dominican University in the areas of integral and transpersonal psychology and Sufi psychology and research methodology. He has published a number of books, uh, chapter, no, of book chapters and articles on various topics in integral psychology and has served as guest editor for revision and integral review journals. He is currently an editor for collaboration journal. Dia Bahman, welcome on board <laughs> on our podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be with both of your good friends and yeah. I look forward to, to talking with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the first questions that has become almost a ritual in our podcasts before we go into your articles and other things, uh, the first question is more about you and specifically how did you come to Sri Aurobindo, the mother, integral yoga, from the very first beginning? Was this first through CIS or first you met them elsewhere? Yes, it was. It was through CIS. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I actually went to CIIS uh, in 1983 or so, and uh, it was about 40 years now. So at that time, I actually went to study Buddhism. I had found that there's a good Buddhist teacher there, and I was very much interested in Buddhism. And prior to that, my background was in more traditional research-oriented psychology and educational psychology and so on at my master's level. And then I was really looking for something very different and uh, interested in psychology and spirituality. So things led me to CIIS, and I saw a picture of Shura Bindo and also a picture of Dr. Chaudhary that was posted in the library and at the entrance at the Institute. So that was my first uh, darshan, if you will, or connection. Although it took me a few years to really begin to understand Shirobindo or Integral Yoga. And, and the mother came a little bit later. Uh, but uh, as I said, my first few years was very involved in Buddhism and 
And then I started to read about Shorabindo, and I used to hear a lot about it. Being at CIS, you always hear, you know, various things from people, but I wasn't really seriously into it. But uh, by the late 80s, when I was trying to finish my dissertation, something very important happened to me, and that was that uh, I knew uh, Bina Chaudhary, the co-founder of the Institute and, and wife of Haridas Chaudhary. I knew her very closely because I worked for her. I um, was a member of Cultural Integration Fellowship, which was an institution they both founded at, right as they came to the United States in 1951. So she told me a lot about Dr. Chaudhary over time. And when I worked with her closely, uh, which was, um, I, she gave me something to do with the collection of books that Dr. Chaudhary had to put it together, do some library work on it. So I came across many books that uh, they had and, and she would give me occasionally articles by Dr. Chaudhary and so on. One article that was very, um, uh, clearly important to me was one on integral psychology that never really got published uh, because Dr. Chaudhary had passed away before that uh, article was, the manuscript was, you know, ready to be published. So that was unfortunate. He died in 1975. But I picked this up and uh, although I had a whole other dissertation project and had to do with Buddhism, uh, all of a sudden I had this um, feeling I had a call uh, to change my direction and I studied integral psychology right off the bat at that point and so that was really the turning point when I began to read more about uh, Sherbin and the mother but first through Dr. Chaudhary um, that was you know because he did a lot of introductory work to integral yoga which was very helpful so, and then uh, I wrote my dissertation on self in integral psychology. And I realized at the time that integral psychology was a topic that was sort of lost over time. Nobody was really dealing with it, but right around the late nineties, there were, there were a few people, Matthias Cornelson and Pondicherry, um, Don Salmon, a few other people who had started a conversation and I happened to be presenting, I presented at the 1998 OM conference, the all uh, USA Integral Yoga Conference that's still going on. Of course, SAA produces that. And um, when I presented my dissertation there, it's sort of a summary of it, there were a few people that really got interested in me. And I guess the word got around. And next year, I got an invitation to go to Pondicherry right around 2000. And uh, Matthias Cornelson had really taken interest in integral psychology and they wanted to do more conferences in it. So that was the beginning of this whole work for me and the connection with the community there in Pondicherry and more and more so in the US. And we had a few more conferences over the years, which uh, we did in India or in the US. Uh, so that was how I got started. But your very, very initial interest before getting into integral yoga was about psychology in general or psychology connected with Buddhism, you said, or where was your mind floating yeah. out? B both. <laughs> I came from a general psychology background. General psychology. Uh, and, uh, but I was alienated about the depth of it and, and the future work that I might be doing in that, although it wasn't too bad, it was educational psychology. I learned a bit about, um, uh, you know, practical things about education and psychology, but I was really yearning for a, a psychology that uh, involved itself in spirituality of the East, you know, especially because by that time I had gotten introduced to Buddhism and was really interested in that. I won't go into the details of that, but I went into psychology of Buddhism with my teacher at CIIS. She was a, uh, a, a Burmese Buddhist teacher from a Theravada tradition, which was deeply involved in practice. And she built a monastery in, in the US and I got involved in helping out there and I was a resident there for a few years and so on. So I was quite involved in that. But all of a sudden this 
as they say, came from the left field and uh, integral psychology uh, showed itself uh, to me as the path for me. Well, I mean, I'd love to now jump into a couple of the articles that we're going to discuss that you publish in our in the journal. Um, and let's start with the American soul, essential qualities and future possibilities, which is number uh, 47, three. And, and I just want to say I reread that this morning. And it's, it's just such a such a fantastic um, article. It really kind of so clearly brings out the kind of the, the contemporary problematic we find ourselves in. And I think it really sets up the questions of why an integral consciousness, what is an integral consciousness, obviously too, but the why, like the, the idea of we have uh, inherited this history, um, a global history at this point, but we have all of these forces that are at play in history. And um, Sri Aurobindo talks about the subjective age, and so that's, again, part of this problematic, the shift in how can we think of ourselves and nature, our, ourselves and the divine, the individual and the collective, the self and other. Um, and, all, and also the last thing um, that, that is really important that you bring out is the ontology of ownership based around the idea of, of America. And so, so this is kind of like such a rich problematic in which to field the question, why an integral consciousness? And it was very um, inspiring to me to read this. And I think um, it's, it's very approachable. I did a little bit of work um, recently in the CIAS, did a conference on on uh, Sri Aurobindo and the integral consciousness. Um, and you presented it as well at that. And I found myself actually reading a little bit of this article through the lens of individuation, which is clear, you know, you're, you're, you are talking about, you don't, don't use that word, I don't believe, but you are talking about the idea of how we individualize and the, the, the ways in which we um, do that through the, like the metaphysics of Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga, and getting to the, the idea of nation states and building collectivities, it kind of comes into the term I use called trans-individuation. Now, we don't need to go there, but I just want to say I was very inspired by this, and it, I'll definitely be taking up your article and my work as well. But um, I was just wondering if you could if, if you could talk a little bit about how, um, like, how is it that we can... Um, how is it that we need to change our language and our concepts to really be equal to this task of this, the contemporary times? Um, just wondering if you could reflect on that a little bit. The language of, uh, like in the general uh, discourse in the United States or academic language, can you be more specific on that? Um, sure, yeah. No, I, I mean, just... In, in general, how is it that some of the ways in which we speak and the ways in which we think th uh, through the language that we have inherited isn't necessarily equal to the task of thinking this, this problematic in the sense of a lot of times the language we use is very static oriented. Even in the idea of democracy, representation, representative democracy, which is like you cast a vote and you sort of become a static image, which is then represented within within yes the plurality but it's like we also need to consider how we are in individualizing and, and individuating and so there's a kind of uh i think a demand to kind of shift our language and i think that Sri Aurobindo was a part of that as well and i think that you kind of bring that out a little bit in your in your in your work like here is a here's a simple quote from Sri Aurobindo that you use in your article the law and power of its own being and to fulfill it as perfectly as possible, to realize all its potentialities, to live its own self-revealing uh, revealing life. The parallel is, is just at every turn, because it is more than a parallel. It is a real identity of nature. Mm -hmm. And so right in that, in that quote from Sri Aurobindo, it's a huge invitation. What's identity of nature mean here? And and how is it that we can find language to kind of bring out the, the uniqueness of that in our times? Mm -hmm. so that's sort of where I was coming from. Yeah, um, yeah. this is a very rich and multidimensional question, even though your focus is on language. But um, um, 
I think maybe I should say something first about uh, how that article came about, because it wasn't something that I was thinking about actively and, and or I was taking notes on and um, hoping to write about, you know, so that's kind of interesting in that sense. Um, what happened was, as you know, I'm on the editorial uh, board and an editing member of, of a collaboration and we had this issue and we went through all the articles that we got and we just felt that or at least the discussion was that we don't really have a lead article that can introduce this whole topic of soul of nations and then the american soul what would that apply for the united states who are we you know and um uh, what is the implication of Sherobindo's idea of soul of nations? Um, how do we understand it and how do we apply it? So some kind of a general introduction to that. And I and I said, well, maybe I can do that as if, you know, I had to do it, so I'll do it, you know, in, in that sense. And then I sat down and I realized, well, there's so many things going on, you know, that I have thought about and I hadn't written about, but that really is involved in, in this whole thing. And um, now to answer in part your question, one of the things that I always keep in mind when I read Aurobindo's work is his teachings about the three modes of being or consciousness, or sometimes called the poises of Brahman, you know, the individual, the universal, and the transcendent, right? These are not just another set of teachings among almost a thousand other things that he talks about. I think these are so important, they're so central that you could use them as a hermeneutic lens in terms of anything you read from Sri Aurobindo. You will see that his whole um, integral framework is really about these three different dimensions, you know, the individual, the collective, and then something beyond both that transcends it, but at the same time includes it and holds it. Um, so as far as the idea of individuality goes, uh, I think that's where we really have in mind the idea of the psychic being, psychic development, the idea of development of swadharma, which is some kind of authentic path of unfoldment of your destiny according to a higher principle. And that means getting in touch with your swapava, which means your um, essential nature, you know. So this self-nature or essential nature is something that I think we all have in us and we need to be in touch with that as opposed to some kind of identity that is created uh, due to psychological and sociological and other forces, cultural forces that shape our personality. So the bottom line is that the ego formation that we come into after a few years into our development as a human being sort of keeps covering up this deeper identity that we call the psychic being or psychic personality. So to get in touch with that is, is very important. Now, where does language come in about this particular thing that I just said? Well, to me, language actually is a hindrance at this stage because language is associated with the cognitive development, even though one end of it has to do with meaning and meaning is processed at a deeper level. Uh, I believe personally that the meaning is, uh, the consciousness behind the meaning is deeply seated in the soul. We know everything we need to know potentially at that level. But we need to also, as a child, make associations in our cognitive development, in our brain development, uh, learn the language that we were born into, learn the culture that we're born into. And all of these things shape us. And as a symbolic system, language, even though it can uh, help us with many things, especially with uh, uh, abstraction, you know, we can uh, conceptualize things. And even though it's removed, from immediate experience, it can help us transfer knowledge from one situation to another that we couldn't otherwise necessarily do. So that's not something that animals do, for example, as far as I can tell, 
uh, not having that cognitive or cerebral capability to, to do abstraction. There's some of it in some animals, but not a whole lot of it. So that's really a human characteristic, but that and language that shapes it and forms it gets in the way of the intuitive process that's a heuristic process that we need to get involved in in order to really connect with that deeper self, you know, that uh, deeper self uh, that we are at the soul level. So here's one problem right there. So language as a symbolic system, it can reveal, it can convey meaning, but it can also conceal. It can actually become a lie, right? Language can become a system of deceit, deception, uh, lying, untruth, you know. So it has both of these capabilities. So it's quite a tricky instrument, I would say. But the language of the soul is, is the silence and the vibrations that comes through that silence through the psychic being. And I think it's very important for us to first get in touch with that and 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 let that process, um, let that blueprint tell us who we really are. Um, for example, what is it that I really know? What is it that I really care about? Um, it's very important, I think, sometimes to go back to our childhood before we were four or five or six or seven when our lang linguistic capabilities were developing and, and we were socialized um, and becoming socialized through the use of language and just see what we really liked. You probably recall Carl Jung during his midlife crisis asked a similar question and went back and found out that as a little kid, he used to make sandcastles on the beach. And he actually went back to that and used that as a way of connecting to his soul. And that unfolded the whole <laughs> second part of his life where he built his own house with his own hand, all the processes that came out of that uh, was really the defining uh, moment in his life. So um, the same way, I think we need to in Yoga, get in touch with a deeper language, I would say here, and, and, uh, and then try to connect with discourse that's out there. And uh, so I'll stop here just to make sure that I'm Ad addressing what you like me to address and then try to connect this to the soul of America question a little bit, perhaps. Yeah, thank you, Bauman, that you bring up this question about language because it is something on which I'm working now. And also, Shri Bindo wrote very interesting things about language, right? where he uh, researched the origin of speech of the Aryan speech in particular, and, and spoke about the uh, seed sounds, root sounds, and uh, explains how Sanskrit came up. And yes. a, a fantastic sentence that you just said, the language of the soul comes from the vibrations of the psychic being. If you allow, I will rub you this sentence and publish it somewhere. Yeah, it's it's too beautiful. I, I really, I really love that. And so so I'm just making a bit of research about these things and it's it's for, also for me it's a new universe that is opening itself. Um yes. but to keep the discussion inside um for for at least for that moment here um inside the article that you wrote here because you were speaking about the psychic being psychic being uh, svadharma um, svabhava and okay these are technical terms that i guess we know what we mean here but also for the um, sake of our listeners of the audience if you may explain these terms and relate it to the collective, because we made the distinction uh, between the individual and the collective. And when we yes. speak about the soul nation, uh, no, no, the, the nation soul, uh, when you speak about the nation soul, this is a collective. When you speak about the psychic being, we usually speak about the individual. How do these two things relate to each other? By the way, mother also if I remember well, said that also nations have a psychic being. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Mm, things become a bit complicated. If you yes, yes. may dwell in in a bit into this into these aspects, it would be yes, nice. yes. Yeah, you know, when I first learned about what the psychic being is, um uh, I actually had come across this topic out of my own research for my dissertation without even knowing the word psychic being or, or knowing what it was, which is very interesting because when I my project was to look at self and ego in different Eastern and Western systems. So I took you know Buddhism and Hinduism and Taoism and so on from the East. And then I took several different psychological schools of the West. And I did some kind of an analysis at the end. I realized, or I came up with this idea that there are three different spheres of consciousness. That's what I ended up calling them. I call them egocentric, psychocentric, and cosmocentric. And then I, I had this intuition that for some reason, Psychology of the West is very interested in egocentric development. You know, that's much of developmental psychology is about that. Transpersonal and humanistic psychology wanted to go beyond that, of course, a little bit. But they borrowed from the East, which was interested in the cosmic consciousness, right? The transcendent cosmic, that, that which is beyond everything, Brahman or any other terminology that you use that goes beyond time and space. And... Uh, so these two, two dimensions were there, but then the third one, the psychocentric, the soul-centered consciousness, it seems to me it was sort of left out. Of course, not in integral psychology, not in Jungian psychology, and not in Roberto Assagioli's psychosynthesis. So I, I later on capitalized on this connection here between these three systems, which in the first part of the 20th century developed all of them developed the idea of the soul and and they were uh very hesitant to use the soul so they used the word self Jung used that uh, uh Sergio used the higher self because the context in which they were working in the early part of the in the 1920s 30s 40s and so on you know this was the positive positivist atmosphere you know that you know had nothing to do with the soul or anything so they had to con con convey their teachings in in somewhat of a, a, a secret way but uh these three systems all really look at the soul as a central point and and integral psychology to me of course uh does the best job of that in a very comprehensive way now swadharma and swabhava i want to talk about that because you asked me that but i wanted to say one more thing the soul when i learned about it it was really helpful to me in charabindo's system to really distinguish it from many other usages of the term because you know the soul and charabindo says that too you know in in the work called the psychic being which is a collection of his teachings and the mothers um you know there is some place where he says the, the the word soul has been used in so many ways in art, poetry, just casually, and heart and soul, and in so many ways that he he avoided that and used the psyche or psychic, you know, so to be specific. But it was the seat of the deep innermost individual consciousness, you know, the innermost individuality. That's what I really loved because that really opened something a new door to me. And um, um, this deeper individuality is something that is covered up by the ego consciousness, by the outer personality. So I was a little bit uncomfortable in the early um, period where I learned about the soul of nations because I wanted the soul to have something to do with the individual, you know. And I, I was a little skeptical, actually, even though it was sure I've been, I was saying, why is he using the soul to refer to a collective process, you know? But of course, you know, the soul in Shorobindo's integral yoga is a very intricate, you know, multifaceted system. You know, you have the Jivatman, you have the Chaitya Purusha, you know, the transcendent aspect, the embodied aspect, and then you have the soul personality, which is the psychic being which is uh, a process, you know, it's it's the process of impressions and learnings and meaningful development that one goes through. 
Now, this process is ongoing, and at every turn in a being's life, animal, human, etc., you are at a particular stage of development with the with this process of uh, consciousness evolution. And at any point, your state of being is called swa bhava. You know, swa means self in Sanskrit, and bhava is means to be. So swa bhava simply means the state of being, but probably adding this one thing, the unique state of being is really helpful here because each of us, each soul is on a mission to evolve and this trajectory is very unique and it's so important for us to find that uniqueness, you know. Um, we're all part of a race or a culture. We all have maybe blue eyes or brown eyes or you know, so on the outer level, even though we're unique, you know, each person is absolutely unique, you know, every genetic characteristic that you can put together, every person is extremely unique, even twins are unique, but there's something behind that that is absolutely even more unique, and that's the state of the being that the person is at. Now, the question is, how does this being evolve to the next level, um, according to a truthful or uh, the a dharma, you know, a path of uh, good development, which is aligned with the soul's trajectory. And that's called swat dharma, you know, or the truth of one's development. So I've used this actually as a, as a way of working in workshops and classes for, for decades, actually, at CIIS. You know, we work with students. We worked, I used to uh, ask them to uh, contemplate on your unique state of being, find out who you are at this very unique level, and then, you know, see where you need to go next, you know, with that, let's see what that tells you about what your path is, you know. So these are similar when it comes to nations, because I think we're talking about a personality of nations, like the Butler talks about, the uh, uh, sort of a, a psychic entity or something that's collectively formed. Now, these collective developments have their own patterns and processes, but for the most part, um, they're dominated by unconscious processes. And each person who individuates or individualizes and comes out of this path, uh, which is important in Jigo Yoga, needs to uh, find their own unique path and their unique truth. And the more people do that on an individual level, the more this collective process becomes guided toward a collective manifestation that is in line with the, with the truth potential of that nation, you know, or, or of that group or nation. So I'm comfortable with that now. And so when we think about the United States or any other country, I think Cheryl Bindo poses this question, what is this country about? What you know, these unique people that have been part of it, um, where is it going? And I think I try to apply this in my article to, to the United States. And uh, if I may say just then, what I started to look at is um, um, there are some other works that are looking at the United States and the problems that we have in this country. And they're trying to go back to an earlier um, you know, indigenous or Native American culture as being a more true or authentic American soul formation that got corrupted as Westerners came in and and now the field is really crowded and, and there's so much, so many problems have, have developed. I question that a little bit because I, I feel that we need to go forward and we don't we can't go back to three or five hundred years ago, even though it might have been great for what it was, but we need to go toward the future. And what tells me where the future lies is the cultural makeup of the United States, which is probably, even though in the old uh, world, there were centers of civilization from time to time where a lot of people migrated to, especially centers of science and um, you know, philosophy or, you know, from time to time, these centers would shift around the world from 
Alexandria to Athens to another place to Baghdad or so on. But these places were very multicultural, even, even back in those days. But the United States was probably the first country where all the different nations of the world came together. So that gives me my first clue about um, where the soul of this nation should be headed. You know, it should be very inclusive of all uh, or all of North America in, in a sense. It should be really inclusive of all the contributions of all these different cultures that, that have come into it. But I try to look at this in a broad way because you can write books and books and books, and it's not even my field of cultural psychology of the various groups in America. And there's just so much written on that already. But I looked at the the basic combination of uh, the indigenous people, the African Americans, um, the the white people, the basic groups that we usually talk about in the United States, and then something. Uh, just came to me, which uh, was very striking. And that was Houston Smith had done some work. I took a workshop with him back in the eighties. I remember he was, uh, he wrote about this later, but he was introducing this idea in his workshops way back then. He basically said, you know, each culture out of the West, India and China, and he grew up in China actually himself, but you know, he said these three different cultures have mastered, you know, the West has mastered the physical consciousness, the material world, you know, science and technology at the expense of, you know, spiritual development and the spiritual dimension has been underdeveloped. India has, uh, has long developed a deep connection to states of consciousness and, uh, but on the surface, at least up until the 20th century, there was a sort of neglect of the material world, which Aurobindo also calls upon, and, and he wants he wanted Indians to become more active and and more embracing of of the material aspect of our being. And he also said that China has uh, mastered uh, laws of propriety, social relationships, but is lacking in in other dimensions. So it just dawned on me that. These three dimensions are very parallel to the three dimensions that uh, Sharabinda talks about, individual, collective, and transcendent. You know, the West has focused on individual and material consciousness. Uh, China has looked at collective social development at the expense of depth development. And India has looked at transcendent you know, teachings, all of Indian metaphysics is starts with the most transcendent you can imagine. So all these three aspects to me make, if they come together in a, in a nation, in any nation, but especially, especially not in the United States, if they come together, they can comprise an integral developmental framework for that nation. And that could be very informative for the soul development for the soul of nation. And I see that the Western contribution, the European cultural input, the Far Eastern input, the Asian as typically are called, and the Southern Asian and the Southern hemispheric plus indigenous groups from all the South and other indigenous nations of the world, which all nations were indigenous at one point, right? But, you know, all of indigenous, uh, input, if they come together, I think this to me is the blueprint for a healthy soul development in the United States. And of course, there are impediment to that. There's a big shadow about it. And so that's a whole other, um, you know, I'll, I'll see if we can connect this back to Jonathan's question of language in the beginning. But at least, you know, I wanted to say this, this is what I'm really trying to say in the article that, you know, the U.S. has this potential to really become the first nation or lead the process of, of really um, fulfilling a kind of a, a, a soul that is fully integrated and then open the way to this other global level of consciousness and integration that Sri Aurobindo dreamed about. So I could see that potential, but it can go either way, so. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it seems like our time's um, crisis is is um, descending into many realms. Um, and 
the coexistence of so many different kinds of crisis are leading to a certain fragmentation and polarization for sure. And so, yeah, bringing up the idea of, of the, the kind of the productive or the, the, the powers of these different realms. And like you've associated them with different um, types of um, developments in different areas in the world, but also the, the shadow of those would be part of the, the kind of critically looking at how is it that we, we want to be the question of what is a we and then what is what is it that we want to become um and you know like as i was reading that this, this, a couple of the shadow aspects came up to me like the idea of the transcendent being a place of escape you can escape the we by escaping into the i or Absolutely. we look at the universal from china and the, the, the aspects of relationality it's um also gone very deeply into dictatorship and and, yes. and and then also then the coming to the West, which is where in my work on kind of cultural psychology and, and spirituality, but I feel that part of my work, part of my yoga is to address my own makeup, my own my inheritance from from history, the containing myth that kind of um, that in which I've accepted certain certain assumptions about human nature, about the, the psyche, about consciousness, about um, materiality, but it seems to me like it's it it really is a question in the West here um, at this point, especially is is that kind of narcissistic, the egocentric is kind of closing itself off. The xenophobia of the other is very strong as well. And um, there's there's a really beautiful quote here at the beginning of your article. I just wanted to read. It's just a sentence here um, from Shrevindo, which is really kind of addressing the idea of okay, how is it that we can start to um get into speaking about something that is universal about our human condition and obviously that went very wrong in the enlightenment times in europe which led to the drive to knowledge and power to an ego center or to a rational logocentrism to a logic of colonialization but here's your window on he's saying east and west have the same human nature common human destiny the same aspiration after a great perfection, the same seeking after something higher than itself, something towards in uh, which inwardly and even outwardly we move, which is, I think, you know, this question of we have a common human destiny, which is really the definition of globalization in a sense of like we are we are all bound together in the state of the world, um, the ways in which technology from the industrial age onwards to digital technology has kind of reticulated the, the relationality of this world, which again has a huge power of liberation, but it also has a huge shadow of, of ultimate, like of even more, um, um, of even more types of control, like um, Stiegler, Bernard Stiegler, a crit critic of, of modernity. And he, he talks about psychopower, the idea like, biopower is when you can can control the like the, the biological function to create to you know to 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 put towards labor power or whatnot you control the biology now it's kind of the the question has changed it's almost like how can we psychologically how, how can how can someone interiorize some type of drive or desire for something and so the problematic again is shifting but this idea that we share a common human destiny is very interesting and it seems as though how um like this idea of how is it that we are uh, looking at this nation's soul and even the the even larger idea of the world union um through di these different lenses these different perspectives but how can we address the problems of it, the teleology of uh, which are built on the assumption of the assumptions of any one of them um and i think that's a very interesting question but I think that that's also part of this, you know, the integration uh, along a, a larger, uh, in, on a global level of like, what are the forces that are pulling us and what are in, uh, assumptions of those technology? This is a really big question right now. So yes. if, if we accept certain teleological um, motivations and assumptions about um, the idea that technology will have the answers or will be able to save us. Well, the question of, well, who controls that technology and what's their politics? Who are they excluding from the idea of being saved in itself, you know? And so yes. I think I'm just trying to bring this all into like 
just you know into the the present times and and addressing some of the bigger questions but the need to actually i think find some kind of a uh, and a different way of approaching the idea of a human essence or not essence because that still is a word that has a lot of historical problems tied to it but something that can like i mean the soul is 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 just there for us you know is but how do we how do we define it and how do we not allow that idea to kind of fall back into some of the other tendencies that are based on our own assumptions, our own ontological assumptions. And so that's just, just a, a comment of like how, how to, to think about the, the future possibilities here, our shared destiny. And I just have like the, the one place I wanted to go here is that another short quote, this is at the end of your article, it says, in short, so far, cultural integration in America has been problematic and divisive and presents a major Im um, impediment to expression and actualization of the higher potentials of the American soul. And so this is kind of getting getting to the idea of, you know, population integration, the idea of like, how is it that we can build a nation's soul without these different types of kind of ethnocentric or technocratic teleologies? And you bring up the idea of the multicultural and the, and the melting pot. And as a Canadian, I just wanted to share when I was reading that, we were being marked by a two o'clock and the this good old, you can hear the bell, I'm assuming. <laughs> no. Okay, it was edited. It's uh, anyway, so growing up in Canada, we did learn about the difference between the American idea of the melting pot and the idea of a multicultural mosaic. And this is, again, we are, you know, in North America, I mean, Mexico is also part of the, the conversation of if we're going to talk about it in a, like the larger sense of a North American soul even. But I just wanted to bring that up. And it was always very interesting to me, even as a young child, to try to understand, well, how does that work? And, and what was the difference there? And I can even, the critique of the melting pot is very clear. You know, you come here and you lose your culture. Obviously, this is not, this is not really, um, I don't think it's it's any an ideal that we hold to or I hold to. And then the idea of the multicultural mosaic growing up in Canada, I can see the problems of that too, where we have people that are come here and are empowered to say, you keep your culture. This is this is great. We want diversity. So it's the idea of Canada, let's say, as it's it's unified by some kind of a cultural ideology, yet diversity is part of that. Yet we have diversity, but how does it relate to the unity? other than just yes. being given right to diversity. How does the diverse components of this larger assemblage, how can they um, they relate to each other? And in the multicultural mosaic, you still find that there are problems of cross-cultural translation. This is within one country. Now imagine the whole world, problems of cross-cultural translation. And so in my work, uh, being driven by my musical experience, but getting into another, other notions of this idea of cultural uh, of cultural and population integration, but really getting into transcultural, um, trying to understand different levels of beyond the multicultural um, mosaic, the cross-cultural, the transcultural and heterocultural. And not to go into all of these now, because this is a different framework, but I just wanted to bring up the question of, it seems to me as we explore different notions and different possibilities of, of population and cultural integration, we also need to overcome a lot of our own ontological assumptions, which are based on a binary way of thinking, based on binary language, based on binary politics. Um, and this is this is kind of just, I guess, you know, this is really at the heart of really what I am struggling with in terms of this, you know, this, this, the 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 questions that that Shri Bindo raises and how can we get to the point of really getting like trying to pinpoint some of the major ways in which we're at this precipice of like we can go one way or the other but how is it that we can really be equal to the task to not succumb to the problems of our history which we can learn learn from so anyway just some a lot there but I just wanted to respond yeah. to your article and please jump well, of in. course yeah these are these are very relevant issues I think I can address a couple of different things here. Um, I think the idea of a multicultural um, fabric of, of a society is at best a transitional formation. You know, it, it's not um, 
you know, everyone for themselves, but as groups, you know, and then, you know, some kind of a fake or transcendent unity that's over and above, which, if possible at all, will always be abused by <laughs> some group or some individual, right? Um, but the key to uh, transculturalism, if you if you will, for me is uh, first on a personality level, individual level of development. I have learned this from most spiritual traditions that I have learned something about, is that to really do yoga, you really have to go beyond your identities that you have created. You know, there are these ways that we have learned to look at ourselves, which are not the direct access to your own self. You know, images and ideas, self-concept and self-esteem, how others see us. You know, we often look at how others see us. You know, we, you know, when I'm going into the mirror and, you know, looking at my hair and see if it's good or not, I'm looking actually at someone else looking at me and deciding that they're looking at me and they're liking that, right? On a holiday morning, I don't really do that, right? <laughs> uh, so all these external ways of looking at what of yourself also what culture gives you what family gives you you know all these have to be sort of undone with you know that, that you have to de-identify with these disidentify with these you know that's actually a process in psychosynthesis you have to disidentify with these there's also this process of neti neti not this not that there's that whole teaching in indian uh, spirituality about not identifying with the body, not with the emotions, not with the mind, and then see eventually what's left. So this disidentification is actually the process of of accessing your own soul nature, um, because everything else is is fake. It's false. It's a formation of some sort, which is not uh, who you really are. Let's say uh, use that word real. Um, and so for a culture to become more transcultural, it needs more individuals that have developed beyond that level of cultural identity, you know. And of course, this is happening a lot in countries like the United States or now in Europe and many other parts of the world. Places are becoming more multicultural. We're eating different kinds of food. We're listening to different kinds of music. We're, we're open to these different things. Whereas left to itself, cultural identity wants to eat the same foods, do things the same way, speak the same language, and, and just, you know, maybe at best tolerate another group over there and not kill them or not abuse them. But that's not enough. That's that's not good enough, you know. So I think where the world hopefully will be heading to is a maybe a stage or two from now is a place where individuals have grown into a more Gnostic state, you know, more divinely informed, self-realized uh, state where they can connect to a deeper side of another person. I always like this idea of imagining, you know, in our soul, how I would imagine myself as a, a more evolved being. It's kind of interesting, uh, you know, process exercise to actually look at yourself and say, what would I look like as a more, what's a more evolved version of myself, you know, and then, you know, think of that or ask the question, what is a more evolved version of this culture or the world? And we get some clues there. And I think the connection to the universal is through the individual, but at the depth level, you, you know, you cannot just go across on the outside uh, because all you will get to is the outside of those others you know and so the the idea of the subjective age is this turn inward where we sort of reach the inner being and in the inner being there will be other beings that we will meet there and once we're there as it's possible just right now even for two individuals who are soul realized to some degree to really recognize that in one in in each other in one another and just be in the presence of that uh, maybe transcendent that sort of manifests in these two individual ways or a group that has several people like that. 
And so the transcendent manifests in terms of these connections that are deep and uh, fully acknowledging the fullness of other beings. You know, I think that's the key, Jonathan, uh, to fully acknowledge the, the wholeness of another being is the most difficult task. I, I, some of my best experiences in my growth and development have been very rare, but occasions where I felt that I am seen in terms of more of who I am, maybe not my whole self, but I don't even know that, but people th that have shown me somehow that they are seeing more of me then, you know, in your job, they're looking at your skills in your, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever condition, situations that you're in, everybody's looking at you from their own point of interest, what they're interested in, you know, what they want to see in you or what they want from you. But if they can see you for who you are, if we are seen for who we really are as young children, there wouldn't be any of these uh, weird developmental processes that get us to these hard and difficult places in our ego ego formation you know so i think the work is really individual and those three dimensions you know have their shadows like you mentioned you know the shadow of individuality is narcissism the shadow of um, relate relationality is codependency and enmeshment you know and the shadow of transcendence is spiritual bypassing you know these are that's actually a core integral psychology material that i've worked in and written about quite a bit but uh that really work has to begin at the individual level and then through that formation the collective forms i think just like whole you know crystals formed by you know each uh piece transforming and then all of a sudden the, the whole crystal forms you know the the collective formations will happen when more and more individuals transform and and uh get to the next stage you know but I think all of those things that you say are very relevant. Um, the only thing I would say is that they belong to a more public discourse, maybe a more academic discourse, uh, where we uh, use our intellect to understand the complexities. But I think we also need a, a simpler language, intuitive language that just you know goes to the core of who we are and get in touch with with ourselves. And the creative and intuitive is is the secret to that, I think, you know. Yeah, uh, I, I like very much how you make very often these parallels with interlope psychology. Uh, I think there is a lot to, to learn about that. Uh, another aspect that frequently I see, it's the, the transformation that I feel we need now is psychic, but also spiritual. Because in, in, in Sri Aurobindo, there is this distinction between psychic and spiritual. No? Of course, also the psychic transformation is a spiritual transformation, so to speak. But in Sri Aurobindo, it's uh, something that goes beyond the mind and some an opening in your heart chakra. No? Yes. And um, what you described was, <coughs> excuse me, what you described was mainly, as I understand it, a psychic opening. No? Yes. <clears throat> mm, but isn't it that we need also a sort of spiritual opening? Let me make it just an example. Uh, mm, what I see the uh, main difficulty, since we are speaking about everyone, not only in the integral yoga community, but everyone nowadays, uh, talks about that we must become integral, that we must become multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and uh, widen our um, intellectual views and, 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 and so on. But when it comes to the doing, yeah, I see that at the end of the story, every one of us is in one's own little bubble, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, for example, if I'm, I have been grown up in a Christian Catholic uh, uh, environment, and most of us still continue to see it from that point of view. Or it can also happen the opposite. I noticed also among Westerners who became enchanted with the uh, Eastern philosophies, then they got stuck in that bubble, 
and mm -hmm. everything what is Western is bad. Uh, so this this expansion towards a sort of integrality is still lacking in in in, in my yeah. point of view. Yeah, you have yes. also this 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 perception, and um, because it's not just about accepting the others as you said it, it, it is also about uh, mm, to acknowledge what did you say there to acknowledge the something the wholeness of mm -hmm. our essence no? yes and that's in words it seems to be the same thing but in reality it's something very different and when yes. for example you spoke about the indigenous peoples um Yes, I completely agree with you. But it's not about going back to the past, but we can we can perhaps enter in the spirit of the indigenous people, how they had this relation with nature, where yes. there, there is not this uh, separation between us and nature, where the land has a sacrality, where they have also some how can we put it the animist view of nature that we must not embrace totally necessarily but we can learn something about it but to do that we must really think integrally and it is not sufficient <laughs> to just yeah. take a book ah yeah interesting but okay but i'm christian so i like to see it from my point <laughs> and at the end i see that we fall back in these bubbles yes yes yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, I don't mean by individuality, um, again, the ego approach to individuality. Um, that is really a dead end or, or you know, it yeah. can go so far, you know, I think any psychological work done at the ego level uh, should be just focused on healing and coming to a, a basic whole sense of who we are so we can start our spiritual work from there um, regarding the spiritual transformation and psychic transformation i think uh, yeah you know sharabindo i think has said that most people's path is a psychic transformation path that means getting in touch with the psychic being uh, the idea of spiritual transformation is through jivatman you know the transcendent aspect of the soul so if there's a way that that can descend down or there's a grace uh, and certain individuals have the personality formation that allows for that, you know, but it's fairly rare because you have to be a very heartful, soulful, uh, well-rounded individual, very egoless or selfless, maybe almost like a saint where all of a sudden you have a descent of grace and a, and a, and a higher mission is open to you in your spiritual path. You know, that spiritual transformation descent of the, Jivatman or the Atman um, from top down. Um, this side, you know, but remember that Jiva Atman and, and psychic being or the core of the psychic being, Jiva and Jiva Atman are really the same thing. They're really two poles of the same thing. So you can enter one way or the other, you know, and then they can both take you to the third level, which is super mental transformation. But those are way beyond most of us. But I think the idea of um, going inside and connecting with your soul opens something up that is very, very rare. Let me just uh, put it this way. Um, when our personality becomes better integrated and uh, less and less unconscious, we are naturally and, and ordinarily able to see more of the wholeness of other people. That's just a, a part of the process, you know. When we are bipolarized and uh, have inner dynamics that are better explained with like Western psychology, uh, we basically project and we're not able to see others for who they are. I mean, not only we don't see ourselves for who we are, we don't see others. There's a dynamic going on. There's always this projection. There's always these defense mechanisms. We only see what we want to see in others. And that's really what's happening a lot nowadays, you know, because the shadow is coming out and that's part of the transformation process. But but part of it is also very dark and 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 very uh, bitter. And we can see that in American politics, for example, right now, you know, but 
um, this this self that I'm talking about is in a way both in and out. It's it's a it's a paradoxical thing. The more you go in, the more of the wholeness you see, and the more of the wholeness you see in others, and the more of the oneness you see in you with others. I think it's just natural unfoldment of the yogic process you know and the psychological work that goes into that up to a certain point may be helpful uh, to prepare you for that but at some point you have to have some input from the psychic you have to have opening of the psychic or you have the, the spiritual you know but spiritual transformation is not collective transformation you know it's still an individual process but it's done through the top part of 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 the consciousness but I think the collective part happens in collective dynamics as different individuals grow and evolve. You know, this is already happening, you know, more, um, you know, in, in, in societies or groups or individuals, institutions where, um, you know, like even a place like CIIS where I spend a lot of my time, there are a lot of interesting people. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's growing. Everybody's in aspiration stage and working on themselves. But still, you feel a, a, a very interesting sense of community because people are just trying to do better. You know, they're, they're trying to go towards something better and higher. So I think, you know, these dynamics manifold naturally, uh, manifest naturally. And uh, and then, you know, there will come a time that it will accelerate because at some point the critical mass will be reached, I think. And I hope that that's, that's the case. But, you know, right now we're at a very critical junction, I think, in the soul of our nation. I mean, it's so obvious that even I remember Joe Biden a couple of different times as part of his campaign was saying American soul is at stake here. Soul of America is at stake here. You know, it's like I'm going to save it. I mean, you know, this is a cry from from the soul of the nation, you know, even though it's a politician that's saying that and may not be deep. But I take it. To have some depth you know there, it means something that it's being set in, in in the public and i think all these processes that we're uh part of right now needs to be understood but we do need like you say marco I, we need uh, a way of life that's simpler more holistic wholesome and of course the indigenous ways of being in the world uh offer that but i might say maybe one thing here that might be controversial for some, but I would say the indigenous ways are more embodied and less cerebral. So the complexities that often arise is in the cerebral discourse, which is out there, which is part of the language that Jonathan started out with, you know, but I, I would be very careful about over participation in that because it's abstract and it's conceptual. Uh, and, you know, we have to look for ways that it's actually manifesting in the individual, you know, if you actually can see that in action in an individual, then there's a way to work with that. But, um, but I think this, this is a decisive. So I am an optimist. I know that sooner or later, uh, we will get there, you know, to a place of better than what we have right now, and for the world as well. Uh, but the process will not be easy. It will not be sweet and beautiful. It, it will need psychological work. It needs collective work. And it's going to be challenging. And I think the best we can do is to prepare ourselves for this challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marco. Um, yeah, so beautifully said, Bhaman, really getting to the core of so many things that are are really um really important to to this community and um and we're so happy to have had you with us to talk and to bring out um like how um how the, you know that your article in collaboration is is really a seed and everybody who gets together to discuss this article or discuss with us is it's kind of like it, it's it, the the it kind of opens to um unique aspects of the seed idea of these seed ideas and and hopefully um really facilitates you know deep questions um and really helps these questions relate to this soul whether it's individual whether it's uh, uh, looking into more of the cultural and the collective um or the transcendent levels um but i think 
I think what we should do is we should have you back for another podcast to discuss your second article because we've really gone deep into this first one. And um, how how is that for an idea? I'm open. I, I'd love to talk about these. These are this is what I live for. I guess uh, maybe you know uh, any other conversation that you're interested in, I'll be very happy to. It's it's so delightful. I really. Um, it's a rare opportunity for me because most of the people are not interested in these things. And so those who do like to talk about these, I'm more than open to it. And I really appreciate this opportunity with both of you. And I would eventually also like this, uh, to deepen a bit the topic about integral psychology. If, if it, even if it's a bit off topic from the articles of collaboration, but it is still in the topic of integral yoga. And I would like to then to talk with you, to discuss with you, at what point are we with integral psychology? Because by the way, I, 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 I read the dissertation thesis of um, Elizabeth Teklinksy, uh, who yes. was one of your students. Yes. And there was also described many of the things that you already said and uh, and uh, it was a, a matter of heart and soul or something like yes, that yes. yeah she uh, she did a fantastic job because absolutely you know, she studied developmental psychology but realized that there's nothing at the higher end in yeah. in the systems and models that we have and she brought the integral perspective into it which is absolutely exactly the, there is a sort of blind spot uh, that yeah. would be interesting to see how we can shed light on this blind spot. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd love to do that. You know, we definitely will have some issue on, on, on integral psychology, but as a way of preparing for that issue, probably in about two years or a year and a half from now. But, um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of people that are interested in that and quite a few experts that we know. So it will be a rich conversation and yeah. I'm happy open to it even before then. So... Yeah, it would be really interesting to deepen also this aspect, or perhaps in another podcast separately. I don't know, in another format, whatever. But yeah, sure. okay, we are waiting for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty open. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we should... oh, Until okay. next time, we'll yeah. close here and we'll we'll speak to you very soon again, Paman. Thank you, Marco, for uh, for co-hosting with me and uh, and. In Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Wish you the best. Okay. Thank Take you very care. much. Bye bye.